All right. Thanks, Lacey, for the wonderful introduction, and welcome, everyone. The topic for today, as you know, is data-driven storytelling. And, and, and um, if you want to switch the slide, I want to go over a little bit about what our goals are for today. Um, we're basically going to introduce you to a couple of the key concepts we use when we teach the data-driven storytelling, or what we often call a data coaching program. Um, there's a lot of content, so obviously in an hour we can just cover a little bit of it. Um, we also want to go through what data-driven storytelling is and what it isn't, because there's a lot of very similar concepts out there. Well, maybe I'd be more accurate to say data-driven storytelling is a big label for quite a bit of work right now. Um, and a lot of different content domains. And then we're also going to go through some examples of different ways that we've used data-driven storytelling to drive business results. Um, the other point we want to do, is, we want to make, is that there's a lot of things that you can do in terms of data-driven storytelling that are very simple solutions. So, you know, we often talk about, you know, big data and storytelling with data and analytics all in the same sentences. And we can make it sound very, very complex. And there certainly is a complex version of it. But there's another version of telling stories with data that can be done by not just senior analytics people, but by every manager and maybe every employee in the organization. So we really want to talk about you know, the complex and the simple. And that leads me to one of my favorite quotes by um, Mr. Einstein which is to always look for the simple solution. And I say I've, I've really used this a lot myself because, you know, I'm trained as a researcher, which means, um, as Lacey would very nicely um, say to me, I'm, in, many, in many cases I'm a data geek and <laughs> act like it. But one has to remember that, you know, in order to influence and do something with our data, we have to be able to talk to people who might not have the same data skills that we have. So keeping it simple is really an important thing to keep in mind. Now, I, I'm talking about storytelling, so I thought I would start out and just give you a sense of how, you know, how I got to this and um, why Lacey is such a great partner for me. So you might realize already I'm the data geek, and Lacey has done a lot of work in coaching um, executives, so she's really been a great partner in terms of bringing the content to a level where we can use it with a lot of different people. You know, from my own experience, I'm a researcher and started doing research in 1993 with really big data sets. So I have my own big data. Um, I have data in thousands of companies, um, 300 variables coded from archival data. We collected survey data from all the executives in these same companies. And I'm talking about thousands and thousands of companies and looked at what predicted long-term performance, looking at what predicts stock price growth, what predicts earnings growth, and even firm survival. And there's a long, long story that I don't have time for today, but we ended up with this concept of employee energy. And when I first started doing the work and presenting to executives, you know, I, I did what probably everybody else would do. I was very proud of my data. So I showed them all sorts of fancy analyses, you know, the longitudinal data, control variables, et cetera. And basically the result of that experience was getting beat up by a lot of CEOs. And the line I remember very clearly was someone saying to me, Teresa, we really like your work, but if you ever do this again to us, we will we will just discontinue communication. So the, you know, in a very difficult way over a lot of years, I had to learn how to make the message simple. And the way to do that was not to look at what my peers were doing, particularly in the academic arena, no offense to all my academic friends, but to look outside of the research area. And one of the areas I went to was um, looking at how directors make movies. So I'm going to start with that concept and just share a little bit, a little bit with you. Because if you think about a director that's in charge of, you know, is responsible for making a movie, there's all sorts of decision process that goes into that. That's very similar to what we should be doing when we're going through our data and we're trying to determine, you know, which piece of data is important and how do we want to present it to ultimately influence something in our organizations. So directors also start with very big data. Some of them have big novels that they're doing a documentary. They have lots of facts that they have to weave together into a story. And directors use something that, that we would propose is very useful for our thinking. And that's a concept of genres. You can take the same story and you can create, you can take the same sort of facts in the same novel and create different stories for different audiences. 
So just to give you an example of genre, we're going to play a couple quick video clips. So look at these and think about, um, think about what kind of genres they are. So genres, again, are just a way of thinking. So you have your horror flick, you have comedy, you have mysteries, you have fantasy. Um, there are lists of probably up to 100 types of genre. But as you look at each clip, why don't you think about the emotion that it makes you feel and what kind of audience we're going after. So, Lacey, I'll pick on you for a minute. Um, three genres, same story. What's your reaction? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, the first one, uh, and I don't think this is probably the same for everyone, but there was a little bit of a sort of a comedy, uh, a comedy flair. The second one was definitely um, a little bit more around fantasy, and the third one was perhaps... Um, you know, perhaps uh, a mystery, perhaps, um, uh, yeah, it's kind of a mystery or a slight horror or, or mm -hmm. um, something to that extent. So right. it kind of took me through a variety of reactions and emotions as I looked through the three. It's always interesting to think that the, the underlying story associated with all three of those clips is the same. Right, and that's the point that we wanted to make, is that even though you have the same data, based on the audience you want to go after, obviously the last one you would not want to probably take your young two- or three-year-old child to uh, or put them in front of the TV playing that video, but you would with seconds. So each of these is a different genre, thinking about a different audience, a different way you want to bring that data, which is a book in this case, which in our case is numbers, and possibly qualitative data when we're interviewing people, but the way you bring your data to life and the way you tell your story differs based on the audience. So let's think about that in a little more detail. So your presentation of your data, whether you're presenting your data in a report and it's something you're distributing, whether you're putting it in a PowerPoint, or whether it's a dashboard, it tells a story. And the story you want to tell should vary based on the audience and really important to what you want to achieve, the result. And, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, but that's what we really see missing in a lot of the current data analytics work. The result is something we're not talking about. You know, the result, I mean, when a director makes a movie, they're definitely thinking about a result. Granted, it's I want to make money, and the path to making that money varies based on the audience. So the result's important, the audience is important. Also, the resources for your work. You might not have a lot of money to put together really fancy reports and distribute it to everyone. That affects you know, what you're going to do and how you do it. Also, your level of confidence. So as you're going through your data and coming up with your story, you're going to have multiple stories, and you might be more confident in one than another, and making a determination about which you want to you know, kind of hang your hat on is important, and part of it is your own personal risk-taking profile. Um, Teresa, 
Yeah, to, to read, so talk a little bit more about confidence and sort of how that aligns with um, sort of this, the, the ability to, to have an opinion to some extent. So we talked about having a variety of stories and you have to have, have one that will hang your hat. We'll talk a little bit about sort of forming an opinion and kind of mm-hmm. make, taking that risk. Yeah, and that's, um, that's been, been a real interesting learning for us. So we've been teaching this data coaching slash data-driven storytelling content for about four years now. And probably the biggest lesson learned as the as the instructors of the content is that the hardest part or the hardest skill for many of our HR audiences is having the confidence to have a point of view. Um, in fact, one of the quotes I remember recently, Lacey, was um, we did a two and a half day custom we had did a two day custom program, and at the end somebody said to me, you know, I realize I've been the mailman for the data. So in a lot of cases, we're really comfortable doing these 70-page PowerPoint decks where we just put everything out there, but we we don't hang our hat on that point of view. And the point of view is the part, you know, being able to do that comes with comfort, comes with confidence, and comes with having some successes. So it is a practice thing. It's not a ma- it's not magic, but that's yeah. a real important skill for I think anybody who starts working in this area. Yeah, and this genre concept will allow you to take that point of view and package it in a way that hopefully will help you achieve that greater level of confidence. So it kind of all comes together. You think about your point of view, you think about the results, and how you integrate those into a, a different piece of genre work that is going to help you uh, elicit the right kind of emotion out of the audience that you're working with. Yeah, and then just to kind of go over the kind of genres we've used, at least in the HR-related work, and I think it would work in any leaders and organizational data, um, you know, the first is documentary. So sometimes you just want to give people the facts. You might not want them to be emotionally engaged in the content. The second one is a drama where you want to tell the story of a character. You really want them to understand, you know, why the compensation is so low that everybody's going to leave. So you might give examples of individual people who are leaving your organization. You know, and the, and the next one is a horror, you know, painting the picture of how, you know, there might, if you don't make a change, then the organization could be in trouble. So, so these genres and more can be very useful. All right, and that leads me to this whole idea of emotion. Um, If genres are about emotion and eliciting the right emotion to get a business result, let's think about the emotions that many of us are driving with our presentations. And (laughs) when I go back to my story, I'll tell you that, you know, before I started changing what I was doing, which is painful, I will tell you that, you know, most of my data projects um, did not evoke much emotion. Well, maybe anger because people were frustrated. That CEO in particular I told you about. But, you know, people get very bored with long, drawn-out data presentations. In fact, there's some work in the area of neurological research saying that, you know, putting a lot of data up is like, um, I think it's the best quote I've seen is David Rocks. Putting a lot of data up is like having, you know, 1,000 actors jumping up and, you know, on and off the stage. Everybody's paying attention to something else. So you might be listening emotions, but you're not in control of it. What I wanted to do next, so so what we've done is painted a picture that there's ways to do what we do differently. Data-driven storytelling can have some discipline behind it, and it's discipline maybe from other areas of work, such as one example is the the director's director's work. If you look at the current landscape of what's happening, um, there's really four things happening under this, what I'll call a content domain of data-driven storytelling. So there's a whole established field of storytelling, which I see a lot of organizations using now to help drive culture. And, you know, CEOs are learning to tell stories. We're teaching our managers. You know, but storytelling is really not necessarily based on data. In fact, there are storytelling clubs and organizations in some of the bigger cities. There's another piece of work that all of you, I'm sure, are reading about, and it's big data. Now, I would argue we've always had big data. Probably what's different is that we can get our arms around it. And, and we have a new marketing label for it, big data. You know, so you're reading a lot about that, and people are thinking about how to merge all the data together and, more important, what to do with it. There's also a body of work around data visualization. And I think when, when I see the data-driven storytelling word used, in most cases it's about visualization. Instead of having a boring um, bar chart, now the bar chart's full of little tiny icons. You know, or te- and, and then technology is important with visualization and, and the rest because we can use technology to have much cooler and prettier charts and graphs and, you know, they can be flash enabled. So what you can do is cool. Um, what I would argue, though, is all of these things are still tools and the art of data-driven storytelling 
is something that someone learns and you're putting together and using all these tools, but data-driven storytelling is something different. It's, it's a label that I would put above, not above because it's better, but it's something that allows you to put all these tools together. So let's take a look at these individually. Um, big data. Big data is very much like the big novel, you know, um, having lots of information. And I just pulled up this little blog that I saw, um, you know, not too many days ago, where there was a little bit of a argument, kind of a pro-con conversation going on about, you know, do you really need an expert to make sense of all of this data? Because I'm seeing that in a lot of HR departments now. They're hiring HR analytics groups, well, and group. They're really, they're usually small teams. But you've got a couple real experts in the, you know, with PhDs that really understand how to analyze data, and they're in charge of the big data. And I think a lot of our organizations are struggling with that. Um, so if you look at the results of the vote, and these are the people who were on this blog site, you know, 56% said, you know, this is a this is a skill set that's uncommon, and you have to hire a specialist to do it. Where, you know, the other side of the coin was saying, no, we need to give the tools to knowledge workers now. My argument would be we really probably are better off doing both. So there's some level of big data that's, you know, it's just hard to analyze. People spend their careers learning how to dig in and use these really, you know, difficult um, sometimes statistical tools. And you're not going to want all your HR generalists or managers to do that. At the same time, once you, you know, the, just because you have a big data doesn't mean you have to do the big analysis. There are pieces of that big data that are very simple and that can be used to empower our knowledge workers. So, um, Lacey, any comments on that? No, I don't think so. Okay. And we're going to talk about that a little bit when we talk about the kind of people you need to tell a good story. Um, the second thing that's out there is visualization. Visualization is very cool, and I put up an infographic by um, a colleague of mine, Karen DeCure Di Nicola, who's um, put together an infographic to talk about you know, fixing waiting rooms. And what's interesting is, you know, I mean, the infographic probably took her a day to do, but doing the research and understanding what data to put in and, you know, how to organize it, that took her months. And the same for us. You know, the storyboard or an infographic or, you know, what you're looking at is just a tool to organize your thinking. But you still have to have the point of view and know what you're trying to do. So you have to be on a mission to do something. In this case, our friend Karen is on a mission to fix waiting rooms. Um, she thinks there could be a better way, and anybody who's gone to a doctor's office would probably agree with her. The the next um, thing in my in my four areas was technology, and you know this is a very simple picture, but most big organizations now have some sorts of dashboards they're using. They have scorecards, they have dashboards, um, they have big charts, they have little charts, they have bar charts, they have um, you know they have pie charts. I mean, there's just all sorts of charts, and they're easy to access. The difficulty sometimes is that we, and, and this isn't just for um, dashboards, for any kind of technology, we roll a technology thinking people know what to do with it. And, you know, Lacey and I have done um, some work where we go into organizations and we do something called a data audit, and we interview the users of the data. And the types of comments we get from managers and executives is a little bit disturbing. So someone who's been in the HR field for many years when I talk to a senior executive who says, and this is a quote, it's really cute that HR has data now, I kind of want to scream. <laughs> so so, um, so it's, technology isn't enough. you know. And, and, lo and I'm on a mission myself, frankly, to reinvent the dashboard. So anybody that wants to join me, let me know. But, you know, dashboards could be something different. But right now we're, we're just at, a, I think, a baby level of, of the way that we're presenting data. Lacey, any, again, any comments? Yeah, you know, what I would say there is, is we, dashboards are beautiful. Teresa and I have seen some amazing, beautiful dash, uh, dashboards. And what we've seen with them is that, one, either not all the dashboard components are shared with the business, or two, if they're shared, they're purely shared as a, hey, please review this report. So what we've seen and what's missing from a technology perspective is integrating the technology with the story and using it, as Teresa mentioned, under the umbrella as a tool to help drive the dialogue. As a standalone, it's not as impactful as as we all hoped and thought it would be when these when these tools originally surfaced. So it's really around using these tools in a way that integrates them to fit under the umbrella that tells the story. Yeah, and, and one of the things we've been talking about is maybe all these details in the dashboard. They're, they're the preventive maintenance side of things. And then on top of it is something like a, the headlines of a newspaper. 
So, so there's ways to use technology to get more story driven, and, and I think that's where our, you know, as we get more creative and we think of that technology just as a tool, not the end all be all, we'll, we'll get there. Um, the last piece is storytelling, and as I mentioned, the, there's a lot of just excellent work on storytelling, and you know, some people people tell stories differently. So, you know, there are a lot of people that love to borrow stories, um, you know, traditional stories, philosophical stories. I tend to tell stories about things that I know really well. One of the things you learn in storytelling is that you need to memorize your story, you need to name the story, you need to have some really good stories behind you. So. You know, it's a matter of really thinking carefully about the stories. Now, a lot of people, you know, again, this whole idea of data-driven storytelling is very new. And I think um, blending some of that storytelling skill, which we all as individuals need to learn with the ability to analyze the data is, is a best-case scenario. Yeah, Teresa, I'm going to stop you there for a second just because we've mm -hmm. gone through the, the four tools and we've covered quite a bit in the first 25 minutes and see if there's anyone that has any questions, reactions, or comments. And if not, we'll continue on, but I want to give the group a chance to engage. Yeah, thanks. Not looking like we're seeing any hands. Yeah, I'm actually so seeing one hand up, Lacey. I'm not sure if we can put her on the line, Barbara. Yeah, yes. but I, okay. Yep. I'm not seeing it, but go ahead, <laughs> Carrie. Oops. Can you hear me? Barbara? Yes, yeah. can you hear me? Perfect. We've got you. Awesome. Okay. Um, thanks for doing this today. Um, my name is Barbara, and I'm uh, at the Nike World Headquarters. And um, about a year ago, we started, we um, got onto a new HR system, uh, HR SAP. And so we are still going through some transitions with that and bumps. And I'm just wondering if you're going to talk about you know, how do you do this when the source of your data comes from different sources or it's, you know, kind of still being cleaned up? Um, is there a way to kind of get around that muck <laughs> and still tell a story? Yeah, you know, we're not going to go into that in detail, but there definitely is a way. And I think it gets back to that concept of having a sim some simple solutions. So, you know, look at the pieces of data you're comfortable with and um, and use that. And, you know, we've seen examples where – I've seen companies in the same case. In fact, uh, one comes to mind where they, they had a lot of data. The problem was their data was about six months late, so they'd end the quarter <laughs> and the data was starting to be analyzed, but they wouldn't get it for six months. So they, even though they had accurate data, it was so late they couldn't use it. And they went to some very simple solutions, just looking at the two or three pieces of data that they could get on a regular basis and use those – to roll out to managers and get them used to data, and it's not a bad way to go. So again, it, you know, everybody's case is different, but I'd, and I'd be happy to talk to you offline. But there's some, there are solutions. Yeah, and I would add to that. It kind of goes back to the piece around having an opinion. So because mm -hmm. you're sort of working your way through all of this data, figure out the piece that you think is important that's driving and connecting with the business. Have an opinion and go from there. Mm -hmm. So don't feel obligated to start. In incorporating all of this this data that you're sort of still working your way through. Start small and then work with the business to help build and grow and use the data and integrate the data in, um, as you're moving in a particular direction. Yeah, and, and I would and add one more thing. There's, um, you know, we hear this from a lot a lot of people, so you're you're not alone. I'm sure that the, <laughs> there's a lot of people on the line who would put their hands up and say the same thing. And maybe part of the issue is that. Even when all your data is fixed, you will try to be way too act. You know, you're going to be trying to be a perfectionist. So, part of the problem in the HR world is that we're trying to be so perfect, we wait too long. In fact, I did another, I did another piece of work where I went out to a big, large audience of managers and I asked them two questions: How fast is your HR function, and how accurate is it? And then asked them questions about, you know, kind of their satisfaction and confidence in HR. And the people who were most confident in HR said their department was fast and less accurate. So they were willing to give up a little bit of accuracy and, and some imperfection if they could just get enough to help them right now. And the example mm -hmm. I remember giving was, you know, HR in the pit in a race, in a race, in a NASCAR race. So it says HR was in the pit, you would never get the car out. <laughs> so they never have a chance to win. And that's kind of what I heard from the managers in this study was just 
just give us what you got so we're better off than we were before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we don't want it to be completely wrong, but in many cases we, we try to be too perfect. And then the other example is that, hey, finance is always, you know, the county of finance recasts the financials. So it's not like everybody else in the company is perfect. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. We have, uh, Barbara, any other comments or questions? No, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks. Feel free to connect with us offline as well. Okay. Um, we have one one more hand up. David Lakeland, uh, we're going to call on you, but your line is not associated with a name. Um, so we're going to unmute everyone and see how it goes. Okay. David? This, is, this is David. Can you hear me? We can. Perfect. Okay. Just a, a couple of comments. Um, when looking at the dashboard, you indicated that um, that this was baby steps. Um, to me, it kind of looked okay. Um, I'd be interested in seeing what your concept is of uh, future dashboards. I, I know that you mentioned that you were interested in um, pushing the envelope further on that, so I'd certainly be interested in in seeing what you've got. Uh, and the other comment that I've got is regarding big data, uh, mentioning that we have a lot of data. You know, looking at where we currently stand with about one and a half zettabytes of, of data currently available, um, looking at that increasing to like 35 zettabytes, um, maybe um, in the next 15, 20 years. Um, just wanted to understand your concept of do we really have big data compared to what we're going to be getting in the future? Oh, great question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, and I guess, you know, my my only reaction to that would be that we have big data compared to what we used to have, and, yes, it's going to get bigger. I don't know that it changes the fact that we still need to know what part of it is most useful and how to focus the data on the right story to drive results. So one can be overwhelmed with data analysis and get into what we call data analysis paralysis. But right. um, again, remembering that results is important, and that's what we're going to move to, thinking about results. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate both of your comments. Thank you. It's so nice when people are talking other than Lacey and I. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go okay. ahead and move on. <laughs> we'll, we'll go ahead and move on, and um, if other questions come up, feel free to raise your hand, and we'll also look for some natural breaks to bring it back to the group as well. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so that, and that was a great segue to this next um, concept, which is, again, all of these tools having the biggest data, and it sounds like even bigger, um, and storytelling, visualization are, are really nice to have. What we're concerned about in teaching is how do you put it all together? And the model we've used is depicted in this picture that you see in the middle here. So data that drives dialogue is really essential. So if, if your data can't drive a dialogue, there's no way you're going to get to action and results. And this is the path that we take. So you've got to find the data that people are interested in because having the dialogue is what in, elicits the emotion. And the emotion is needed to get people to take action. And you need action to drive results. And if we're all spinning our data and there's no business result, then frankly, why are we doing it? Why are our companies going to spend millions of dollars putting together these big databases and hiring, you know, the, the, the data people if there's no business results. So starting with results in mind, um, we would propose is essential. And I'll tell you, we've had arguments, well, no, heated discussions <laughs> about whether results are necessary. And I, and at least for me, I've never been convinced otherwise. I mean, there is that preventive maintenance thing we do where we just collect data and we don't talk about it every week. But you're still collecting it. Because you want to drive a business result, you want to show you're trending, you're seeing if things are broken, you know, you're looking for opportunities. But you know, knowing the business result and being able to connect to a business result is essential for the investment that we're putting into our data. Um, and what I would suggest, and Lacey I think would agree with, is that this focus on data results is missing from much of the work that we're doing. So what we want to do with data-driven storytelling is really drive to results. And there's two ways that we do that with this model. So the first, the one on the left, is you know, starting with a situation where you just have data. You didn't have the choice. You didn't, you didn't get to choose what data got into your HRIS system or the database that you're using. And you know, how do you take that data and find the story to have a dialogue? So if you think about the concept of data and dialogue, well, that's where genre comes in, right? That's where tools come in. That's 
really knowing your audience is important and thinking about who your audience is. So does the data have to be really perfect for this audience? Or And is the top senior team the right audience, or is it every single manager or every employee? Is it the rest of your HR team so they can be informed and you know, go, out, go out and do some other work? So who's the dialogue? What you know, And then from that data and dialogue, think about the actions you want people to take and the results. So you're working from the data to the results to find the story in the data. Now, the second part of data-driven storytelling is working backwards or strategizing. In this, in this case, you have the option of getting new data, or you have so much data you're trying to decide which data to choose from. So you're looking at a lot of different data sources. You know, in this case, the most important thing is not the data. The most important thing for you to know is what's the business result you're trying to drive. Now, knowing what the business result is means having a lot of conversations with people who are touching your customers and who are in the senior leadership team. But not just senior leadership. It's, you know, people who are touching the customers understand trends. Um, so, so it's having a really good set of informants. And once you know what a couple key results are, or maybe the one result that your organization needs to achieve in the next six months, then you work backwards and you start hypothesizing. So in order to get that result, what is the action people have to take? Now, this is where you, it's really important to have confidence in yourself and you have really good informants because you have to hypothesize. You have to guess. And there's no guarantee that you're going to be right. So, but... This is what you need to do. So you have a result, you work backwards to the action. Once you think about who are the people who have to take the action, then you can start thinking about the dialogue that has to take place. And the dialogue is all about influence. So you start having conversations about, you know, if the person who has to take action or the department, let's say, is my finance department, then, then maybe accuracy of your data is really critical. And they, you know how they how to influence that group. So, and, and different people are influenced in different ways. So we're back to the genre. Um, once you know what the dialogue is that has to happen, you know how you would compel action. You know, then you work backwards to the kind of data you need. So some people are really qualitative data people. You can have all the numbers in the world, but if you don't have a case to talk about, they're not going to believe you. So those, so again, working backwards allows you to pick the right data to drive a business result. Yeah. Whether, whether you're working from the model on the right or the model on the left, sort of think about these steps as a pipeline. If any area of your pipeline is blocked, your, your end result is going to be affected. So you think about um, and the, the model on the left, you know, you've got your data. If you don't have the dialogue, it's almost impossible to get to the action or revol result or vice versa, any of the areas. Same thing with the model on the right. If you're looking to a result, but you don't have the data or the dialogue or the action to, res or the, uh, action to help drive those results, your, your pipeline is blocked again. So think traditional mm -hmm. plumbing issues, <laughs> working on all four of those areas and keeping the free flow of information and the way you're engaging with the people around you and your particular audience um, as integrated throughout the four steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one and one thing to bring this to life on, on the left on the left model, you know, I work, I do a lot of survey work, probably more than you can imagine. But I see managers when they get their data, they always want to jump to action because they're so smart and they know what to do. But they don't get a result from it because they haven't engaged their employees in the dialogue. And usually the action requires more than just a manager or the other thing that happens is the manager doesn't get credit for it because and the employees think no one was listening to them. So the dialogue, even in something simple like a survey, is really critical. Yeah, so so when you think about how to come up with a story, you know, I'm gonna go back to that big data blog that we looked at. Um at least our learning is it, it takes two kinds of people. Individuals who are trained as scientists and really good at analyzing data are not necessarily good storytellers. I mean, go to any academic conference and you will know exactly what I mean. Um, because when you're trained in the data analysis, you think the data speaks for itself, but it really doesn't. Um, there is no perfect data analysis. You know, we're not explaining 100% of the variance, no matter what we're doing. So what you need to do is have the data in addition to the context. And the context comes from the dialogue people. Now, what this means in the world of HR, which I, I assume many of you are in, is that we need our data analytics group or our data consultants or whoever's really, you know, kind of thinking and doing the big analysis to work very closely with the people who are in the field in order to get the kind of results that we want. Because you need the context 
and the data analysis. I mean, the problem with the, the really sophisticated data analysis also is that most people don't understand what the heck you're talking about. And even though you, I mean, I'm just say, speaking from my own experience, I'll tell you, I mean, I'm so excited about it. I found something nobody else found. It's just, you know, I have control variables. I have analysis. I have statistical significance. And I show individuals. And if I can't make that simple and put it in context, it just goes over everybody's head. And it's not because they don't have the intelligence. They just really don't care. So making it compelling involves data people and dialogue people. What I wanted to move next is to demonstrate what happens when you put data and dialogue people together. So um, these are just some stories. Again, I do a lot of survey work, so I'm going to pull from that experience to give you some examples about how to find stories in the data using what I'll call new lenses. So in all of these cases, we have the same kind of data. Basically, we're using an engagement survey, maybe with a little bit of individual questions, you know, some questions varying, but pretty much just the same old, same old engagement survey that companies have been doing for years. But in each case, the organization was going through something different and their business strategy was different. So we took the data and we took it out for a spin and you know, used the new lenses and found new things in the data that compelled people to have much more interesting conversations of looking at whether the numbers went up two points or ten points. Um, the lenses were important for coming up with stories. So I'm going to, again, just really quickly go, go over these to give you a sense of what you can do, even if you have limited data. So in this first example, we have a company going through massive amounts of change. They were purchased by another organization. Um, they, were, they were trying to put together, they had a lot of money invested in their change management programs. They made the assumption that change was bad. Nobody was going to like it. You know, based, There's a lot of literature to suggest that. So in addition to doing their normal survey work, we added just a cut, two questions that were new. We asked every individual to rate the personal rate of change they were going through and the rate of change for the group. And the reason we did this was because the company was doing a lot. They were, first of all, they were, they were focused on change. This was something they had money to invest in. This was something the senior execs cared about. This was a result that was important to them, that we get through this change. So we thought we really need to focus any, any work that's being done on the company's most important strategic mission right now. Um, or strategic imperative right now. And basically we had these two baby questions. So in a zero to 100 point scale, you know, how much change are you going through? And then we took all of the rest of their data and we plotted it using this lens. And we created a little three by three, um, or a nine box, as people like to call it. And what we learned from this was, at least in this organization, the highest performance and the highest survey scores were for people in the high, high box. People going through a lot of change personally and a lot of change in the organization. This was a huge insight. Because what they realized was they were spending their money on the wrong people. If the people going through the most change were doing all right, then why were they spending all the money there? They should be spending it on the groups that weren't doing so well and that they wanted to retain. So what we learned from this was um, that a lot of the assumptions they've gone into their project with were wrong and that the people who were actually most um, disengaged were those where there was a high rate of change going on for them personally, but not in their group, where there was a mismatch between the two. So there was just, again, this is a real short example, and I could do three hours on just this, but this little lens and having just a tiny little bit more data allowed us to create, um, to, to create a story that was very applicable to the audience and to help the organization drive the business results. Lisa, anything that you want to add there? No, I think you covered it all. All right. Um, this is another example, and so in this case, the organization was, um, they had just reworked their, their business strategy. And they were, and if you talk to the senior exec team, they were just kind of frustrated with the employees. They were thinking that the employees are kind of whiny. I'm sure no one else has heard this, but, um, you know, they gone, they put together another strategy. They wanted the employees on board with the new strategy. They, and they had this employee engagement thing they'd been doing for years, and they just thought, you know, here we go again. They're going to complain about all the same stuff they complain about. And so we thought, well, how do we help them, again, take this same data that they're stuck with, because they always have gotten it and nobody's going to change it, and just have a new lens for it. So as part of the strategy discussions, they started talking about the employee value proposition. We did a little twist with it, and we said, okay, let's, what if we talk about the employee value exchange proposition? And it's what employees get versus what they receive. And then that whole conversation was very in line with the senior team because 
again, they were worried that it was just all about giving, giving, where they wanted to incent the employees to move in a new direction. So we took the same old questions and bucketed them under employee engagement, and said employee engagement is what employees give. And then we took a set of core questions and said, okay, what do they get for that? And that was a conversation we engaged the leadership team in, so we were in agreement. And then we used that again as a new lens to plot this three by three. So, so it's a pretty simple process, but the conversation we had with the executives about the data and the lens is what led, it, led us to having this data be much more meaningful in driving a business result. Um, and again, there's a long, long story around this, but basically we plotted where everybody was, the percentage of people in each of these buckets, where we said, you know, where are they on employee engagement, low, medium, high, and where are they on value? So the high, high bucket is people who are doing stuff for the company and feel like they're getting an equal amount in return. People on the low, low, you know, they're not doing much or not getting much in return. But if you think about which piece of data you want to respond to, and what your priorities are, you focus on the top right bucket and the one just below that because those people are easily moved up. So we were able to segment the population in a way that fit the business strategy, and the business strategy was important for a business result without having too much data. Now I'm going to give you one more example before we move to the other side of the equation and start. And, um, in this case, we again had employee survey data and um, the company was evolving, and they were very concerned about things like innovation and where the hubs of innovation were. So we used, um, a lot of you might have used in your work, um, organization network analysis to see what, not just what the formal hierarchy looks like, but what's the informal hierarchy in the organization. And then we took the informal hierarchy and basically um, added the data in this new structure so you could look at formal hierarchy structure and informal structure. And it led to some very new insights that helped them think about reorganization because number one is they didn't want to get rid of the people who were at the, at the forefront of the hubs and they could see what the hubs were doing. So which hubs driving innovation, which hubs driving energy, and which hub might be driving behaviors that they're not interested in. So if I go back to genre, those three cases I gave you are examples of using a lens with traditional data that were, we, you know, the companies had. They didn't have the money to get new data, but the lenses were like a, genre, like a genre for them. So the first genre, change is good. We learned about change. The second one was employee value exchange. Hey, it's more than one way. It's two-way. And the last one is looking for the unknown superheroes. So, so again, I, we did that just to get you a sense of ways that you can think about genres, think about telling your story with a little bit of creativity and looking at the data differently. And what I want to do next, I'll oh, go ahead. Well, let's stop again there, Teresa, and see if we have any questions. Right. Any questions, comments, reactions? Sorry, I'm not seeing any hands. Am I missing anything? Yeah, and we'll have time for questions at the end also. Okay, so let's keep going then. All righty. Um, so what I want to do next is give you an example of going the other way on the data-driven di um, data dialogue action results model. So if you start with results in mind, you know, what does that look like? So I'm going to give you just a really quick example. Now, in this case, um, we started with a result that was very specific. So it was um, an organization that had six months to basically turn around the company or it was going to be sold. So, you know, it's about as straightforward as you can possibly get. Um, there was no doubt we had a strong point of view from the CEO who's in charge of this company about what was needed to win. This individual felt the employees were getting in the way. So um, it, was a very, it was a very unionized organization. Um, there was evidence quality was low, high rates of absenteeism, people, you know, if you want to use the word disengaged, you know, just lots of problems. So you take that kind of population, you have six months to turn it around. You know, again, you can use fear and horror pretty well. <laughs> that genre works. And, and, in fact, it did. So it was a bit of horror, but educating people also. Um, and what they did was, on a monthly basis, um, collected data from employees, use data from the business on, you know, things like, you know, parts, quality, cost, um, you know, how productivity was, how product was moving through the system and combined with information from the employees and told a story every month of how well they were doing and what the odds were they were going to be able to survive. And when the employees realized that they were, they were the answer, there was no one else they could point their fingers to, 
Um, it moves so much from a horror story to a drama where the employees are incredibly involved and positive. So, so you just saw the dialogue change very quickly. And the, the really interesting thing about this case is it wasn't just that we had the six-month result in mind, but every month they, we broke it down into specific goals for that month. So month one was something specific. Let's say the first thing you have to do is raise quality. So everything was focused on that. And from a very intensive dialogue with the employees who, again, this individual CEO felt was in the way, um, they were able to turn the organization around and achieve the result, and the, the business was not sold. In fact, they did the opposite. They put a big financial investment into the site so that that site could be um, could basically manufacture product for other site other wasn't dependent on just one product offering. Um, one other tool that I would suggest, and we use when we do the custom data coaching work, is something we call a data audit. Now, when you use the word data audit, you'd think that I'm going out there and we're trying to find out if their data is accurate or not, and that's not the case. Um, we've got a really – this is a very simple version of it, so the actual audit is more complex, but we look at data in a couple dimensions, and one of it is, is the data simple or complex? And just, you know, for a blink test, you know, simple data is um, data that everybody's going to agree to the accuracy. So if we were all sitting in a room, we could count the number of people, and we'd all agree to that. So it's not like, you know, it's based on somebody's opinion or, you know, the, the accuracy of where the data is stored is in question. It's really simple data. Um, and when the data is simple and nobody's going to argue about it, then you, you, again, don't have to worry about justifying the data. You get to start with talking about the data and maybe storing the data. And then you go up and the data gets more complex. So the data might come from point in time data to um, multiple points in time. And whenever something's multiple points in time, it's, there, there's questions about accuracy and you know, the reasons why there's change scores, for example. And then as the data gets more complex, it gets bigger. Um, you're, doing, you're doing more complex modeling. And frankly, it's harder to explain to people. And it's easier for people to argue about why it's wrong. And I'm sure you have all been in rooms presenting data where that one person puts up their hand and says, well, is it statistically significant and, you know, why should I care? So the complex data is the data that's, you know, that you really got to be confident about because it's very complex. And what we do is look at the levels of data and, and plot data dialogue action results. Which data at what level is driving dialogue, what kind of dialogue, what kind of action and what result. And if you do the type of audit, it's very useful for think, for finding out what of the data you're collecting is being used. And if you have the right conversation, you're also asking what their business results are, you know, what are they looking for in business results in the next six months so that you can use that to do the, the working backwards thing we talked about going from results to data. So I'm going to move pretty quickly through these last couple of slides when you're at the end because I want to make sure we have time for questions. So just to recap what we did, we talked about some examples where you go from data, dialogue, action results, and the story is important there. I have my data. I'm trying to figure out what the dialogue is, and we can use different lenses. We can get creative in our analysis. You know, we don't have to um, just go with the simple mean, what's the highest score, what's the lowest score. You know, there's some creative ways to do that. And that's an important part in analytics and data-driven storytelling. So it's not just doing the fancy analysis. It's creating lenses and stories that match what the company cares about. And the second part in working backwards is starting with the results in mind and coming up with those hypotheses. All right, I've gone through a lot. If we were doing data-driven storytelling and had more than just an hour, we would go through all of these pieces of what is data-driven storytelling. So there's really three pieces to all of it. What we did today was the first two. We talked about big data just a little bit, you know, but you have to have data. It has to come from a source, and you would, you would like the source to be accurate. You know, every data has its pros and cons. And then once you have your data, you have to focus the data on a story. And that's what we spent the time on today. And looking at just one tool in particular, the idea of genre and maybe and writing a script. The last piece is what you do with the story and how to tell the story. And that's a really important part, and that's where you really have to hone in on your point of view. We did not do that today. Um, you know, again, that's probably a subject for other webinars, or, and it's definitely what we do in the data-driven storytelling work. So in terms of the learnings from what we did go through, you need data and dialogue people to be successful. Um, the point of view, we can't, we can't really you know, say this enough, but the point of view is critical. And even if you're wrong, it's okay. You just you know, back off and do it again. But the point of view is critical if you want to have an input, impact. Um, the other thing is 70-page presentations, they do not work. So point of view means short, crisp, get to the point. 
And the skill set of data-driven storytelling is new. We've seen um, the students that we work with are staying in touch with each other, they're helping each other, because it's an acquired skill, just like being a coach, which is probably like why I like the term coaching, because you don't just go to coaching class in two days and you're, you're perfect. You might be certified, but it takes training, it takes working, and it takes practice to be really good at it. Um, Lacey, anything you want to say before we, we start with questions? Um, no, you know what, I'll hold off on the last few slides and we'll cover that at the end, but we do have some questions. Um, so we have one question that's saying, can you talk a little bit more, can we talk a little bit more about the data audit? It's a really interesting concept. Uh, yes, uh, the way that we have done the data audit, um, and, and we'd love to do lots of them because I'd love to have benchmarking data on what data drives what result, not just what's the average of you know absenteeism in the industry. But we go into an organization, and, and we and Lacey and I have both done this, and you know we could certainly teach other people to do it. But go into an organization, and it involves a lot of interview work and archival work. So you're going through the documentation, you're looking at what the data is, and you're putting it into. We have a we have a big map where we map the data on complexity, and then data, and then for different types of data, what's the data? What's the dialogues that are happening? What's the action? What's the result? And we get it from looking at archival data and interviews with all the users of data. Well, not every individual, but types of users. So your HR team, senior leadership, middle managers, you know, the kinds of people that are using the data. And then we present the results. And what I will say is in every case where we presented the results, I like to use mind mapping. It's very visual. Lots of data. So you see like this chart that has tons and tons of data points. And then dialogue, well, not so much um, dialogue. It's about half the amount of data. Uh, action, ooh, that's kind of getting smaller. So I mean, I got a lot of a lot of space in my mind map. And then results, I'm lucky if I have one one thing in the results. So um, so getting even if you just create awareness that hey, the data we're paying money for isn't driving results, or maybe you're driving results and nobody knows about it. And we see that a lot too. It is driving results, but because we're, we're if we were good storytellers, we'd be writing down the stories and people would know them. But in in a lot of the cases, I think. Um, in the world of HR, we're very modest, so people don't tell their stories. But then, again, no one knows that there was a result associated with the data. I would say the other piece that's been interesting, as we've um, went out and talked and interviewed with the line and taken that information back to HR, HR has consistently been surprised with what data the business is finding most useful. Mm -hmm. So either has been surprised at what they found useful or has been surprised that they're using that data in the way that they are. So it's also highlighted a bit of a disconnect in terms of what data HR is presenting and giving to the line and they're using or not using and what data the line is using or the business is using um, that that is outside of the scope of what HR is providing or has been something that HR hasn't been highlighting. So just connecting and uh, sort of bringing to light the, the disconnects in terms of who's using what and who knows about it has been really interesting as well. Yeah, and, and I would encourage anybody interested in the audit concept, please let us know because um, we, we really are very interested in having doing more work in that area and having good benchmarks on what data drives what results. So what you what I'd love to be able to do in a couple of years is say, you're going through a merger, here's the kind of data you need because we've seen these are the results other organizations have had. Great. Any other questions, comments, or reactions? We still have a few minutes, so we're happy to engage. Okay, here we go. Um, Great, that was just a comment that's probably not worth sharing. So as people are thinking about comments, I'll just go over the last couple of slides and highlight what we do have coming down, um, uh, so excuse me, coming up in terms of schedule. So Teresa and I will be facilitating the Data-Driven Storytelling Workshop in Los Angeles on June 25th through 27th. It's a great opportunity to really engage around the concepts that we've talked about today and um, really sort of build and broaden your network around data-driven storytelling. What we've seen with this group um, in a public forum is that the folks that attend really create this network to um, be data coaches for each other and with each other. So it's been really amazing to watch this community grow. We're really excited about what we've seen so far. And we do have a question. Um, how do we minimize people making up stories that aren't accurate? Ah, great question. Using the data to push an agenda. Teresa, your thoughts first, and I'll jump in. 
Yeah, so number one, I'd say let's just be honest. We all use data to push an agenda. Um, so <laughs> I think the second part of it, though, is how do you make sure that, it, that it's not accurate? And, you know, I've really not seen that happen before. I'm sure that there are cases of that. I think, um, again, we know there are cases of that if you study ethics, but it's, it's not something I've seen that's a really big problem. Um, and, and part of it is I think people don't want to be embarrassed, so if nothing else, it's the power of peer pressure that they they don't want to make it up. But but there's no doubt that people use data um, maybe for, the, for their own purposes, their own agenda. And I think if we can think about this whole concept of results, you know, we can control maybe a bit um, the kind of data people have access to and why they're having access to it and what they're using. So, so again, it's one of those things where, I, I don't know, I, I kind of don't worry about the outliers. I, I often talk about you know, in HR, we're always in search of the deviant, and we create policies and practices for the one person who's going to go wrong. And I guess I wouldn't focus on that if I had the option. Lacey, yeah. anything else? No, no, I think that covers it nicely. But how, how about we ask it in a different way and see if it draws a different reaction out of you or I. How do we minimize the bias associated with it? So when you think about people mm -hmm. telling the story, how do you how do you how do you get them to focus on the results rather than minimize the bias? Yeah, that is where the data comes in. I mean, the whole idea of data-driven storytelling means that we're not just, you know, we're we're using robust data, we're using the best data. But I just had a situation, I was working with somebody, and we were analyzing data, and, and they kept trying to get the data to say something it really wasn't saying. So there was there was a bit of a, my you know, again, your, your own influence skills and being able to speak to data. And, and again, maybe it has to be, it's the simple data that helps. Because when the data is really complex and people don't understand it, they'll use maybe less rigorous ways to tell the story. And so they have their own lens. They have their own you know, three people they talk to. But you have to get that on the table. Like, kind of, it's, You don't want to be negative and like, my data is better than your data. But I think bringing people around to understand that, hey, even though we know that's true for these three people, you know, here's the case and the, and the data represents something different. It's, it's a learning and it's a skill set. Um, and, and I think it's, what's important too is like a lot of the people who might you might think has bias are people who maybe are more of the storytelling people. So if you get those storytelling and dialogue people to understand and work with the data people and not think of the data people as their enemy, that's going to go a long way. I also think thinking of the the concept that I refer to as a pipeline: data, dialogue, action, results. When you're thinking about those different components, to some extent, I think it helps. It helps you think about things outside of your own lens, and particularly if you're also thinking and integrating in the, uh, the genre piece. So thinking about and helping others think about the steps, the components, the foundation um, helps to some extent, and I'll say it this for lack of a better word, keeps people honest. You know, you're thinking about the steps and how you integrate the steps together rather than um, sort of your own bias in terms of what it is you're trying to achieve. You know, the results are there, but you're trying to do it in a way that helps move the business forward. Yeah, and one more comment. Um, I know this a lot of people. Well, we have a few people that are writing to us privately, and I you might want to put your last name in privately also, so we can go back and find your email and and give you the information you need. And then, Lacey, what's the phone number there at the center if people want to call? Yeah, it's two one three seven four zero nine eight one four. Okay. Again, two one three seven four zero nine eight one four. It's quite easy to find on our website as well. Um, you can contact Carrie or myself for the front office. Um, also, uh, you know, we're easy to track down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there were a couple of questions that were asked, and, I, and we've responded privately. The folks asking about the program, the workshop, the data-driven storytelling program. Um, and one thing I do want to point out is this is actually a workshop in the truest sense. So you'll be bringing your own data. You'll be bringing your own um, your own examples that we're going to have you work through. So by no means is this two and a half days of Teresa and I lecturing. <laughs> we really are focused on you and helping you build the skill set that's going to go that gives excuse me that's going to give you the uh, ability to go back, tell the story, and um, drive results within your own organization. Yeah, and, and I mentioned one more thing. We're, this public program is coming up in June. It's in the Los Angeles area. And um, we also do custom programs in organizations. And, do you, you know, we're open to companies that might want to um, host the program in some other geographic area. The way we teach it right now is two and a half days. And, again, we try to keep up with keep um, in touch with people afterwards because we do see it as an important skill set. And, Lacey, that's our tie-in to the next slide you have on custom programs. 
Yeah, no, I, I think you've already covered it and we're past our time. So All feel right. free to reach out to us with any questions that you have. Teresa and I are really excited um, about the upcoming program. We're excited that there's so much energy with the folks on the line. So feel free to reach out to either one of us. Uh, thank you so much for your time today and energy around this topic where we're looking forward to seeing um, where the field, HR ta uh, the field of HR takes this. Uh, Teresa, thank you for the great concepts, topics, and uh, your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, and um, very nice to have you on the line, and you know, hopefully we can reach out and move this work together as a community. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Okay.